right. So uh, we can start the panel if you want. It's 6 o'clock. Anyone comes in late, they're hosed. Uh, my name is Tom Zoller. I write and draw for the My Little Pony comics. I also uh, write and draw a comic book called Love and Capes. And my new book, Long Distance, just started coming out last week. And I have written an episode of the Spider-Man cartoon, which if you have been to Europe, you might have seen, but hasn't aired in the U.S. yet. So I certainly have not illegally downloaded it to take a look at it. Um, so I, what do you guys want to talk about? What do you want to know? Um, I come up with a plot first, and sometimes it's it's a confluence of events. So I wrote the next two issues of Friendship is Magic, which brings back Flutterbat. Uh, and part of this was that I really wanted to write an Applejack story, and I had this idea of doing Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, but with apples and ponies. And And in the process, as I was trying to figure out that story out, I was drawing at a convention in Denver, or actually it was Comic Palooza here, and somebody comes up and says, can you draw Fluttershy as a vampire? And the thing about being a pony artist is that you get a lot of weird requests, so that didn't, it didn't phase me, but then somebody else came up and asked for it, and then two more people asked for it, and then I'm like, wait, this is a thing. This isn't just, this isn't just that you like vampires. This is the, apparently Fluttershy is a vampire, because I'd been on the road so much I hadn't watched the episodes for a while, and then I found out about Flutterbat, and I said, Flutterbat goes after apples, which you want to have attack people. Oh. And that's how that that's how that script got pitched. I tried to focus on all the characters that I hadn't written yet, so while Twilight Sparkle has a big role, um, there's a lot of rarity. Oh my goodness, do I like writing Pinkie Pie. Um, she is nuts, and I adore that. She's, she's one good acid bath away from trying to po poison the equestrian uh, water reservoir. She's, <coughs> she, she's the Joker. I want to write that story. I want to write the story where she goes nuts. But I don't know if I will. Plus, it's hard to convince IDW to write a story where Pinkie Pie murders thousands of people. Um, so, But, you know, some pony version of that, something a little better. You what? I'm sorry? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it would, Off the top of my head, I would say it would be pro Twilight Sparkle. It could be Rainbow Dash. Weirdly, I think Rainbow Dash is a little more Superman. Because um, Twilight Sparkle has that bookish kind of I would train with the League of Assassins mentality. And Rainbow Dash has the I will fly over everybody and be really, really awesome. Uh, which is kind of the way Superman would be written if he wasn't being done as a Nolan film. Can you bleed? What? You don't understand Superman. Although when I saw you have him snap a guy's neck, I was pretty pretty down with the fact that you didn't understand this character at all. Oh, we could go on about Man of Steel. It's, it's best if we move on to another topic for a while because that movie disturbs me on a molecular level. Even though Christopher Reeve accidentally smiles through the take, the scene where he goes, no, the people, that's so important to Superman. And in, uh, in Man of Steel, he's more like, I'm going to confine this fight to where our product placements are. So we're going to have a big fight in front of Sears, and we're going to smash through an IHOP and uh, anyone else who's, uh, who sponsored this movie. I just wanted to see a scene of him trying to take it to a cornfield. But... He didn't, he didn't rescue enough people, because I figured out in a superhero movie what my favorite scene is, because there were two movies that did it back to back, and I realized that this is, to me, if you want me to be happy with a superhero film, because apparently I'm the only audience that counts, um, you need to have the scene where the superhero is presented with a situation where he cannot possibly save everybody, and then he does, and the movie which does this the best is Iron Man 3. Because when everybody flies out of Air Force One and he says, Jarvis, how many can I carry? Four, sir. All right, I'm saving them all. And he does. And it's just, that's my favorite part of the movie. And for as flawed a movie as Spider -Man, Amazing Spider-Man 2 is, he's got one web shooter flying backwards as Electro is electrifying that whole stairway thing in, you know, in Times Square. 
and he saves them all. And in Superman, he doesn't save anybody. Or, you know, he'll save a he'll save an army guy and then the army guy gets killed and it's like, hmm, you guys don't get it. So Oh no. I'll talk about men's fashion model trains all day long, but eventually work must intrude. That's that's from Die Hard. Secretly, I run my life like suits. I just quote uh, movies as much as I can. But that's one of my favorite shows, too. Uh, any other questions about writing? Yes. Yes. Oh, wait, no, there's more. Sorry. I haven't had that, uh, especially with Pony, because I have written so few. But the thing I find is that when I unlock a character, I want to use them all the time. The I pitched more than a couple Zakora stories before the one that got picked up. I had I wanted to do a Zakora one shot for Pony Tales, which <laughs> the note I got back was it was just too weird. Um, because the, the thing that bothers me about Zakora is that she doesn't live with the other ponies, and it seems very exclusionary. So I wanted to create the situation in which we realize that Zakora is choosing to live where she lives. So my plot was that the ponies invite Zakora to Ponyville, and she accepts. And in the process, she kind of gets you know steamrolled by everyone saying that you need to live in town. And in the process, uh, they spill some of her magic items and it turns into a Tex Avery cartoon. And it was, especially the stuff where Pinkie Pie is kind of controlling reality, that's, it, it was the most Dada-esque I've ever gotten. And, uh, and that was a little, it was a bridge too far. But that's also why, if you've read my uh, um, Fluttershy Zakora story, it's why Zakora's hut blows up in the very beginning. And she says that I work on a lot of dangerous stuff, and that's why I live out here. Because I, I needed, you know, I know it's headcanon, I know they could totally rewrite that if they wanted to, but I just wanted some sort of reasoning why she was out there. And it's it's not enough of a line in the sand where, you know, the, the plot didn't revolve around that. So as a result, there's nothing to show that would do that you can't get those things to, to fit in your head. Um, just to <coughs> just to have things that make, make sense to me. So there, there are characters like, I, oh my goodness, do I like writing Trixie. I need to I need to write more of her. Um, where I started figuring those characters out, but I haven't I haven't had anything where there are things I would have done differently, but I haven't had anything where there are characters that I thought, oh, these two characters would have been better in this situation than the ones that you wrote. Now, the Flutterbat arc is the first one that I got to write all six at the same time, um, although they make a brief appearance in the beginning of the Rainbow Dash issue I did. Um, the first time I got to write them all together, so maybe. Once I see it again, I'll say, oh, maybe you should have used, you know, Rarity a little bit more. Although I, I used Rarity more than I thought. Rar Rarity is a hard one for me. I, I haven't, sometimes I have tr problems getting her to interact with the rest of the ponies. Because, like, I, I, I see very clearly how all, how the other five ponies can be talked into going in an adventure. And she doesn't have the skill set that blends well to go with them. So it's... It's just in my head. I, I certainly know it can be done, and it can be done well, and I may be overthinking it, but that's one of the things that gets gets stuck in my brain when I'm trying to pitch ponies. What else? Yeah. Here's the story of how I got involved with My Little Pony. Um, I was working on Loving Capes for IDW, which they had done uh, at that point for about two years, I think. And they announced at San Diego Comic-Con that they were going to do My Little Pony. And IDW has a tendency to do like six trillion covers per issue. And my fiance is a huge fan of My Little Pony. And I'm not stupid. So I went to the editor there and I said, hey, I would love to, I would love to do a cover for the new My Little Pony book. That would just be great. And they said, do you want to pitch the comic? And I'm like, I'm not stupid. Yes, I would love to pitch the comic. 
Uh, so I wrote pitches for, I think, four of the six ponies for Ponytails, and they went with Twilight Sparkle, which was a mixed blessing. I, I'm really glad they went with it. Uh, the two things that happened was that after approving the pitch, Hasbro came back and said it was too close to an episode that they were doing, which I think turned out to be the Daring Do episode, because the original story was much more about Twilight Sparkle having a favorite author, and then, but it was it was still very much J.D. Salinger, and then finding that author who had be gone into seclusion. So I had to rewrite the script. Also, because Twilight Sparkle is arguably the lead character, uh, they said, well, she's going to be first, so we need that in about three and a half weeks. I'm like. Oh, I was not ready for that part. Okay. <laughs> so I've, I've gotten a lot more comfortable drawing the ponies since the, the first issue. There were, there were things that I actually did not understand. If you look at the book, um, Summer Maine is actually taller than, uh, than Twilight Sparkle throughout the entire thing because I did not know. You know when you see Princess Celestia and she's taller because she's older, I thought that an older pony should be taller than, you know, it's called my little pony. It's not my average sized pony. And that was, you know, it's, it's a little stuff like that that I hadn't figured out. The thing I thought was interesting, and I will still fight to my dying day that I'm right about this. Um, there's a part where you decide that the ponies are going to use a typewriter. And then you try to figure out how that works. There was a lot of that first issue that's me going, but how do they do this? How are they eating a sandwich? How? They can't hold a knife. How do they make the sandwich? I don't, I don't understand that. If you if you watch the show, there's a lot of them getting dressed, where they go off off camera and then they come back dressed. Then it just happens. We totally tied this cape around. Don't ask. Um, so I created a typewriter, and if you look at the scene where you see the typewriter, there is a there's it looks like one of those things, those big spikes that you you know would put notes on, but it's actually designed to go on her hoof, so that it becomes. She can type like that. And then later they did an episode where we see reporter ponies. And that's where you find out that ponies write in binary, that they only have two keys. So I contend that the same way that there is a special uh, typewriter for court reporters, so they can type faster, that people who write for a living like writers use a different kind of typewriter. And that's why her typewriter has multiple keys on it. So. What else would you like to know as I stall to take a drink of water? I did, yes. Oh, I had... I had Pinkie Pie getting kidnapped to be like a, an entertainer, and I think that was really, really close to something they had done. I'd done a, a Fluttershy story where she started um, getting taken advantage of for the entire issue by her friends because she wasn't standing up. And you know, the message was kind of like, "Don't, it's okay to say no to your friends. You can't overextend yourself. Um, I didn't have Rarity because Rarity was already claimed. I didn't have Applejack because for some reason I couldn't break Applejack. And why am I going, why am I going blank? Who am I missing? Pinkie Pie, Rarity. Rainbow Dash. Uh, oh, um, I kind of did a Top Gun thing with her, where she had to train a couple of young... She she got knocked off course and had to train a couple other ponies. Um, and I think it was just that they, they very much wanted different people working on all the books. So you only got one bite at the apple, so to speak. Apple chat. Um... So once I had written one of the main six, I was kind of locked out of writing the rest of the main six. And then I pitched on the, the next round as they were doing Celestia and Luna and Spike. Um, I did have a Spike. I, I kind of wanted to do Spike as Flowers for Algeron, where all of a sudden he gets much smarter, and he gets smarter than Twilight Sparkle, because um, I thought that would be really interesting. But then um, they came up with, and largely it was my friend Tony Fleece, who works on the book, who came up with the idea of Friends Forever, which is, you know, pony team-ups. It's Pony Brave and the Bold. And that allows you to, one, it allows you to use some really obscure characters. Like, um, is there a Bab Seed and... Uh, no, no, no. There, uh, it's Bab Seed and another one of the really, really obscure characters. I know they, they did, like, uh, Granny Apple and Flim and Flam as a team-up. It's the kind of thing that the normal series would not support. And I, I really appreciate doing weird team-ups like that. 
Um, and to me, because I grew up on the DC and Marvel, or yeah, the DC and Marvel books that did team ups. Some of the team ups weren't straight up team ups. So there's there's a really good Superman Swamp Thing issue where the two of them really don't interact, but they're having parallel stories. So that's the way I treat it. And occasionally I read comments. And one of the comments I read about uh, the the Fluttershy is a core issue. It's like, well, you don't really see them being friends. I'm like, eh, I think Friends Forever is more aspirational. It's just more they team up. Um, you know, <coughs> Friends Adjacent wasn't the, the name of the series, but it could have been. Uh, so, I, yeah, I, but I like having the weird pairings. And the uh, uh, Trixie, I was reading um, character descriptions on, on a one of the sites just to like jog my memory and try to think oh you know it's not that I don't know the characters but when somebody else distills them down sometimes you get a description of the character that makes you think of things differently and when I read Trixie I went oh my god she's Harry Mudd from Star Trek I can totally write Harry Mudd Harry Mudd's easy so it was making that connection that allowed me to pitch the story that I did you had another question It's totally controlled by Hasbro. Sorry, I'm just... From Hasbro, like, do you need to put this in a comic, or do you need to go in this direction? Or do you need to have free reign? Free reign, that's funny, because there really is. Um, <laughs> I'm not in a position where I've been asked to do anything by Hasbro. I have been told not to do stuff that I've pitched, but I haven't been told they haven't said, oh, we'd really like to see something that uses the QD Mark Crusaders. There are things that we hear that we're not allowed to do. Discord was a complicated character to use because I think everybody wanted to use him and they were trying not to overexpose him. I, I had a fight for him to be the resolution to my uh, Fluttershy story. I had, a, I had a backup plan if it wouldn't work, but I thought it was a much stronger story if I actually used him and, and was allowed to. It's possible that Annie and Katie sometimes get asked, but I do not know that, and I'm not a regular enough writer that they would go to me and say, we really want to do a story about this. We need you to write that. Now, uh, most of the comments I get back from Hasbro are very technical. They're very professional, and they'll say that it's too much like an episode, or I had Princess Alessia open up a dimensional portal in some pitch, and they said she can't do that without the mirror. The mirror's the only thing that can do that. So. It wasn't germane to my story. I, it becomes almost an engineering problem where you look and say, okay, is there another way I can make this happen without violating the concepts that they're setting down? And for the most part, that's, that's just problem solving. That's very easy. Um, I was very happy, though, when I pitched Flutter back because you get the notes back and it says, okay, the characters cannot do this and we'd prefer if you didn't do this. And, um, but they said, it's the only time I got a positive note. So I'm not, I'm not saying I got negative notes. I got, you know, these are the things we needed to change just straight up. But they said, we're very, very glad to see Flutter back back. I'm like, excellent, because that's what I was going for. It was nice to be on, in front of the rolling boulder of her popularity, rather than, because I pitched, um, I wanted to pitch on Power Ponies, because they did that as an annual. And when I did, they said, we already have that in the works. We've been interested in that. I'm like, well, I write superhero comedies in My Little Pony. I kind of think I'm the perfect person for it, but okay. Um, yes? Uh, you said one of your previous answers that you had thought of something from Hasbro itself about what amounted to a continuity issue. So Hasbro is the one that makes sure that everything follows continuity rather than a comic book or the writer itself. We're all watching out for it. So if I pitch something that Bobby the editor on Pony knows is wrong, he will fix it first. I, he's the first line of defense. And then Hasbro signs off on everything. I'm sure there are things that slip through the cracks. I, I will admit, I do not read all the comics. Um, there are so many, and I apparently travel a lot to comic book conventions. Uh, sometimes, sometimes there are little art mistakes. Um, sometimes they're, they're interpreted where I've, I've heard a couple comments about uh, the first three pages of the Flutterbat arc are out, and it starts off by referencing the fight between Celestia and 
Celestia and Nightmare Moon. Um, and it's, it's mostly a plot contrivance. It's not going to be a huge deal. But some of the comments I saw were, yeah, it's like, oh, this is completely inaccurate to the fight. I'm like, well, it was kind of, I thought it was. It wasn't. Uh, I watched the episode, and it's all what happened, and that's what I was going for. I just, I just kicked up some debris along the way. Um, but, yeah, they, they do watch out for that. They try to stay true to the characters. Ultimately, um, as writers for the, the ancillary stuff, like the comic books, we're trying, to my mind, we're trying to put all the toys back where we found them. You know, I can't, I can't get Twilight Spark on my patch and have that be continuity. I've, I joked around uh, when I was in DC that in the Flutterbat story, the way it ends is that all the ponies are vampires except Scootaloo, and it becomes I Am Legend. And that's just, that's just the way the series works from here on out, <laughs> feeling it. But yeah, you know, we don't, we don't make huge changes, we just try to enrich the characters. Um, and there are things you can get away with that if, you know, if the character's not going to be seen again, you might be able to do a little bit more with. But I like fleshing, I like fleshing out the stuff that they say. The thing I like about my Fluttershy's horror story is that it says that it's essentially one of the stories where Fluttershy and Discord hang out, which by the season four finale, you get the impression that they have done, that they're still, you know, that they are friends and have had friend time, but we never see that because arguably, hey, you came over to the house, we got along, and everything was awesome. It's not a great story, unless you all of a sudden have the animals talking. Um, but it's nice to be able to expand out that stuff that you know the ponies are having adventures between the episodes. You know that there, there's more stuff that's going on. We're not seeing the complete arc of everything that happens in their lives. So filling out those middle spaces is sometimes a little more interesting than trying to create a new normal for any of the characters. Some of you may have heard this from last year when I pitched My Little Pony Made Sparks of Axe. Uh, IDW will do line-wide crossovers that are, that are really interesting uh, and kind of bizarre sometimes, but they had Mars attack the IDW universe. And at the panel I was at, Dirkwood, who I don't know if any of you guys have seen Dirkwood, Dirk has a very, very distinctive voice, and he says, so Mars is attacking the IDW universe, but we're not saying what books. And I leaned into my microphone and I said, uh, I say my little pony, and that's a pitch. And he said, if you can get me one by the end of the panel. And I did. I emailed it to him on the panel, and then on Monday after the convention, he went through his email and was like, I didn't realize you actually did it. I thought you were just joking. <laughs> I'm like, no, if, if anybody is, you know, if anybody higher than me in IDW says, you know, I'll take your pitch, I'm, I'm going to get them a pitch. So the, the, the pitch was that the aliens from Mars Attacks come to my little pony universe. And they come to Equestria, but because the physics are different from Equestria and because of spells that, that Celestia has placed on the planet, none of their weapons work. So losing violence as a weapon. You know, they, they like to start pie fights and pillow fights and stuff like that because they're, they're doing whatever they can because all they know is violence. But once violence is taken away from them, they actually become friends with the ponies. And they leave. And there's the ending I really wanted to do. And then there's the ending that I was ready to do if it had gone through. But the ending I really wanted to do is that they become friends. And they leave. And they go back to their home dimension and they run into more of the Mars attacks aliens who can't understand why they're not angry and mean and fighting, so they destroy it. <laughs> they even pass it. Um, and I knew there was very little chance of that ever becoming an issue. But I like that part of the reason I did it, part of the reason I did it is I like those kind of challenges. Like, can you come up with a pitch in five minutes for this? But the other part is that I want to show my prospective employers that I can come up with really off the wall stuff. Because ideally, I want them to be sitting around, well, okay, ideally, I want them to be sitting around like it's an action movie with really severe blue fill lighting, and they say, there's only one man who can help us now. 
and then you know, cut to me. Um, but I, I just want to show that I can do all sorts of stuff that is interesting for them, because hopefully that means when they get something like Jam in the Holograms or something like that, that they think of me, and then I get a chance to pitch on it. Because I would like to do more. I like doing, I like doing loving games, I love doing long distance, but I need to, I need to switch between creator own stuff and stuff that ha tends to pay up front, like My Little Pony, it's just a good business decision. So it, I kind of want to alternate between the two, and that, that makes the business of being an artist or a writer a lot easier. What else would you like to know? How are you doing that? Yes. Eastman's cousin, he went to school with me at the Hubert School. Uh, I have not met, uh, I have not that I know of met either of them except to say hello to them as we pass each other the IDW food. Um, Lair, I, I don't know if he does conventions at all. Kevin Eastman seems to be in a lot of IDW conventions and he's usually behind a line of a thousand people. So I, I have not had a chance to interact with him. But it's weird because you've a point in your career where you really want to meet people. Like, you want to say hi to them, and then you would actually like to talk to them, and the second part is hard to do. So, like, I, I stopped meeting Stan Lee, because every time I meet him, it's for the first time. Which is fine, because there's no reason he should remember who I am. But I also, you know, I'm not going to pay 60 bucks to stand in line to meet him again for the first time. I've got his signature work in. What else would you like to know about writing for Thomas? You look like you have a crap. Yes? Well, uh, two things. First of all, in your opinion, since I've been trying to figure this out for some time, is a question on Earth or is it on its own planet? Um, in your opinion. I've always considered it its own planet because if it is Earth, it doesn't matter because it's so different. Done. You know, it's, it's like Star Wars. It actually takes place a long, long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And in um, the first Timothy Zahn book, they make reference to Luke Skywalker having chocolate. And it's a part where you realize that Star Wars could be in the past, our past. I'm like, I don't, know, I don't know if I like that, I don't know if I don't, but it doesn't matter because you're never going to Earth. So, second question. Okay, second. Have you ever considered uh, your own story, uh, Luna? Um, I've stayed away from Luna a little bit just because she's one of those tremendously popular characters that I know that they did a lot with her, that Annie and Katie did a lot with her. So, since I'm not a regular writer on the book, a lot of times it, it is easier for me to get away with pitching characters that don't, that haven't been touched, like Sakura or Flutterbat. So, I would like to do something with Luna. I haven't figured out what I want to do yet. They're, yeah, so it's the same way that Applejack was for, for the first year or so that's Pitch Pony, where I think she's an interesting character, I just don't know what I would do with her. And there's so much good stuff that's been done with her that I don't want to be derivative. You know, it's, it's certainly not going to be her turning back to a nightmare moon, it's not going to be... Um, 
Those are my... My old movie Transformers. Rainbow Dash vs. Starship. Yeah, so that kind of stuff. I, I love making jokes about the movies not having guns. I'm, I'm convinced that Spike is the most powerful character in my little pony universe because he can pick things up.
fits every iteration of that relationship. That is the exact perfect thing to say, and it doesn't commit you too far one way or another. And I, I live in awe of that line, and I want to write more things like it. What else? I feel like I'm more than you. establishes that, 
that's just stuff that can get rewritten, and that's where the problem becomes. If I can figure out a story with her where she doesn't have to talk a lot, and she doesn't have to do anything that contradicts any of her character, but doesn't create anything about her character that could be contradicted, then I might be able to get that story through. But it, the thing I like about the comics is that you can do the obscure characters. You can bring back characters for just a scene that you wouldn't be able to get away with. Like, Discord is the reveal at the end of the, the Fluttershy story, but we didn't have to pay John Delancey to come to read his lines. Which, nobody wants to hear somebody who's not Delancey do Discord. So you're limited by his availability. It's also, you know, like, uh, Krusty the Clown on The Simpsons. It's always great when he shows up, but you need to know that Kelsey Grammer is available to do that voice, because if he's not, it's just not going to seem right to you. So, the, the comics can get away with bringing back some characters and not having all the, all the hurdles that other places have to go through. What else? It's an hour-long panel, we've only got 20 minutes left. Sorry, I'm just trying to make sure you have it all taken care of, sometimes I... And the thing that kills me is that the, the Flutterbat story doesn't come out until next week. We have such fun talking about that, going, why did you do that? Why did you hate these movies? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's going to be really interesting. Uh, she comes back, uh, like I said, it's Acme Village Tomatoes. She comes back in the first issue, and then all the ponies become vampires in the second. They all have vampire names, because when I was writing the script, I realized that uh, she's called Flutterbat, and I was referring to them as like, you know, Applejack, Vampire. So I decided they needed names. So there's Appledrack, and uh, Nostra Rarity, and Rainbow Light, which is my favorite, and Twilight Sparkling, and in her cute mark has an apple on it, um, and then Drinky Pot. Uh, which her, her, balloon, her balloons on her cutie mark turned into uh, drops because I couldn't go ahead, you know, because apple juice could be clear. You know, the, the vampire part of me is like, make them red, but uh, it's probably, you know, Hasbro would not cotton. So her version of Pinkie Pie that had blood as her cutie mark. Um, but yeah, so they, they get vampire names, they only get wings. Uh, Rarity starts wearing a key for no reason whatsoever, other than it's cool. Because she's the one who would do it. This has nothing to do with comics, but how about your thoughts on Interstellar? You know, I really liked Interstellar. Uh, I, I think Interstellar needs to be seen in a movie theater, because there's so much of it that is, is quiet, and it is meant to make you feel small. That doesn't translate when you're in your, in your house watching it on a screen where you're a little more comfortable. Um, I've heard rumors about the ending being different. Like, like once he goes into the... Can we talk about Interstellar? Is there anyone who has on their Netflix queue that is going to be upset if I start talking spoilers? Alright, uh, there's something he does at the end that uh, his, his end story could have ended about 20 minutes earlier. Really? Yes. Um, which, which I think I would have been fine with. I, it's weird, I really like Christopher Nolan films, and I like the Batman films, I don't like any of his other superhero stuff. Um, I like his, I like that he does complicated plots and, and weird things, and I like that he builds a story. Like, I, I don't mind long movies, one, because I feel like I'm getting my money's worth. Yeah, like, okay, nine bucks for a, for a movie, might as, well, might as well keep me there for two and a half hours. If it's 90 minutes, you might be upset. Um, but also, you know, I, I like that he's not writing down, you know, he's not, he's not simplifying anything, he's not, his science was mostly accurate, and there was a, a fair amount of interest in it, so I, I really enjoyed it, but I can also see why it's not for everybody. And sometimes, you can actually straight up watch something wrong. Uh, the, the big one for me was The Simpsons, uh, where when The Simpsons first came out, I remember watching it and going, yeah, it's alright, I don't get it, but it's, it's okay. And then I taped the episode where they buy the RV. Because I had just come home from art school. And I watched it. And then my friends in college had not seen it. So I brought the tape and I watched it with them. And I saw what they were laughing at. 
And once that happened, it like unlocked in my brain, and then I realized how funny the show really was, but I wasn't ready for it. The other, the other one that I always think of is there's a Stephen King movie called Sleepwalkers, which is horrible in, in all sorts of ways. But it was promoted as being Stephen King's first original screenplay. And when you watch the film, you realize it's Stephen King's first original screenplay written on the way to the studio. But there's, there's a point where you're, you're expecting like good Stephen King. After the first 15 minutes, if you let go, if you go, this isn't good Stephen King, I just paid to see a USA Up All Night movie. If you, obscure reference lost on younger viewers. Um, but if you let it go and you go, I'm, I'm watching a crappy movie, and that's probably what he was going for, because nobody, there's a scene where somebody gets killed with a charcoal pencil which is awesome because we're a bunch of artists seeing it. But, so the guy jabs it in it, and it goes through the guy's head. It, so if you, if you take a pencil, and you hold it up to somebody's head, it's not actually wide enough to go through to the other side. The pencil would, the pencil would have to be huge. So for that, to, for that to work the way they did it, it would have had to keep traveling after he let it go. It had such velocity. It was like very alley velocity that allowed it to keep going and then on the other side. But once you watch that scene, you're like, oh. I, if, you, if you let go, it becomes a lot better. So, and, and actually that is, for a large part of the success of My Little Pony, to me, is like the scene in Superman the movie where Superman rescues Air Force One and the pilot looks out the window and sees Superman flying the engine and the engine just waves, this is Superman. Um, and then uh, he, turns to the, he turns to the pilot and the co-pilot says, don't ask, just fly. Just fly. And, and that's My Little Pony. I don't know why My Little Pony has become this successful. I don't know why it has resonated with so many people and I don't know why. When there's so many things on TV, so many forms of entertainment, this, this hit the magic tumblers and, and pierce through to people. But I, I'm just glad to be part of it. But one of the theories I've heard is that people meant to watch it ironically. Like when it came back, they're like, oh, I'm gonna watch a stupid cartoon and make fun of it. So they weren't ready for it to be awesome. And it just, it slipped under their shields. It's like, oh, this, this is really good. So that's actually uh, X-Men First Class. I was expecting to be a train wreck. And I remember being happy with the film going, is this good? I just, I'm really liking this. So, I can knock out all these all day, apparently with a taste one. Uh, what else would you like to know about writing comics? Who else? Yes. Which is, uh, what is the hardest part of writing up your comic? Getting the paycheck. So I'm sure IDW is great to deal with. Um, for me, the hard part, the two hard parts I have is one is the pitch. Because you have to distill it down in such a way that it excites the person you're talking to. So you don't have a lot of words to waste. I've seen pitches that are like three pages, and that's too long. And I think when you write a pitch, you want to write it in such a way that you give your editor lots of places to punch out. So, like, I really, I want to go really early and say, this is a pitch starring Rainbow Dash and, and um, Trixie. Because if they have another Rainbow Dash Trixie pitch in the works, they're not going to go for it. And I want them to be able to read a sentence and go, oh, this isn't going to work. <clears throat> and then I give them a quick, you know, like two sentence description, and then I go longer. So the idea is that if, if at every stage I've interested you, you can go a little bit further. I don't want to force you to read two pages to get to the surprise to his ending. <clears throat> and sometimes, like, when you're writing a comic book script, you don't want to surprise your artist. You don't want to have a shadowy figure in the background of four pages, and then in the fifth page say, oh, and it turns out to be Superman's father alive on Earth. Because the artist may have made drawing decisions based on what he thought that character was. And then he gets to that page and finds out that it's supposed to be this character. Well, he may not have drawn it like that. And you would think that the artist would read the entire script all the way through. And most of the time that happens, but that doesn't mean that you don't forget or don't start thinking about different things or how to handle it differently. So that's one of the 
That's one of those weird parts where you want to have that shock ending, but you also you need to get the, the person interested. So you, you don't want to hold anything back. When you're doing your pitch, you don't want it to be rejected and go, oh, but if you knew what the surprise ending was, if you knew that Bruce Willis was dead all the time, you would have you know, approved this movie. It's like, well, why did you buy that part? That was an important part. You should leave with that. So that's hard, and writing for artists is hard for me, only because I am an artist. So I have, I have a very, it's all internalized. The, the way that I write and draw at the same time happen concurrently. It's hard for me to break those two things into, you know, into different movements. Like, I know how to swing a baseball bat, but I don't know that I could explain it to anyone how to do that because those motions are all blurred together, you know, from holding it to hand-eye coordination to how you swing to how you change the weight. That's all one motion that's been practiced. It's hard to break that in half and say, okay, I'm going to go this far, and then you're going to get to do the rest. I try to be very conscious and respectful of my artists. Um, a lot of times I don't know who I'm writing for. So I wrote the pony, uh, the, the Flutterbath stuff that I had not known Tony was going to draw. I was very glad when he did. And the cool thing about Tony is that he will push you to be better. Because I, I wrote a joke. Um, there's an Apple joke where the punchline was, I need to build a watch. Because the Apple watch. And Tony called me on and goes, you can do better than that. And I'm like, you're right, I can't. So that line does not appear in the book. A much funnier one does. So he will push you that way. But I'm, there's one scene where there are 12 ponies in one panel. And I, in the plot description, I apologize for that. I'm like, I need to establish all these characters are here. I'm sorry. But I'm going to give you a splash page with all with five of the ponies and vampires that people sell for about a grand. So I got that going for you. I try to balance that out. I, I don't want everything to be overly complicated and the script to be just a pain to draw. I want to mix. If a, if a thing has to be drawn, I will ask for it. But I try not to ask for complicated, detailed, obsessive kind of things like that over and over. Because I'm not. I'm not Alan Moore. I can't make the ashtray important to the story in the way that he can, and I want the artist to be able to participate in it. So I I try to make sure I'm not asking for the moon each time. What else? We got we got about seven minutes left. Yes. Oh, um, it's, so, I have been slowly cultivating a group of people who can employ me. DHS is not yet one of them. But it's weird how those things happen. So, I, I have my first animated, animated piece done. I've been able to use it as a calling card to get other other things. I am going out to LA in a couple days, and then I will have lunches and stuff with people. A lot of it is staying in their face. It is, it is hard for me where I am in my career to approach a company and say, I really want to write for you. It's more knowing somebody who works on it who realizes I would be good to do something for them, which is Spider-Man was my first thing. And the story editor was a good friend of mine. He would not have hired me if I wasn't good enough to do it. But he was the one who was willing to take a chance on me. And now I have a produced credit. Um, I am told that uh, he and a friend of mine were reading my spec script. And they're like, isn't it great to read a friend's script? It just doesn't suck. So I was, I was very heartened by that. And I was, I was extremely lucky that uh, Dwayne McDuffie, uh, the late Dwayne McDuffie, uh, helped me with one of my pitches. Uh, the first spec script I wrote, he read. And he was on the phone with me for about three hours talking about it. And he told me all the good stuff and all the bad stuff and the little stuff and, you know, like how to format this and the big stuff, like why are you doing, you know, your, your morals not that, that sharp. And, and he was the one who said, look, this script is good. If I got it from one of my staff writers, I wouldn't throw it back. He said, but I want to read the script Hans Allen writes. And it was an interesting way of thinking because I was thinking of doing a script and I didn't want to be just the romantic comedy guy because I'm known for love the case. And he's like, this script is your calling card. It doesn't, it's never going to get made. 
So don't worry about being pigeonholed as a romantic comedy guy. It's your wheelhouse. Knock it out of the park so that they go, this is a great script. And I want to find something for him. And they're not going to find a romantic comedy for you. They're going to just find an opening for you. And you got to do that. So there, there is no romance in my Spider-Man script. Uh, none at all. But it's, it's cool you're going to write that stuff. And also, I have a photo of the cast recording. Um, Iron Man is in my episode, and Adrian Passar, who played the Prophet, which is one of my all-time favorite TV shows. He was also on Heroes, and he plays Gerald Talbot on uh, Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. He plays Iron Man. And it just weirds me out that he had to say words that I wrote. That, that is my favorite. Ultimately, I want it to be my script, but it doesn't mean that I can't get a good idea. Uh, Stan Lee has a great line where he says, never give the audience what they think they want. So, you, you'll see it a lot in, in TV shows that have romantic uh, relationships to where everybody, everybody wants Ross to get together with Rachel. And this is going to be a bad example because it could have done it and it irritates me. But, um, everybody wants Ross to get together with Rachel, but if you do that, you burn that bridge. You can't go back to it all the time. So while the audience wants to see Ross and Rachel together, they really want to see an interesting storyline involving them possibly getting together, but not necessarily that happening. So what I notice is stuff like people ask, people ask about Flutterbat, or saying how much electricity, or Octavia, or characters that I wouldn't necessarily have thought of using, and when I see that there is a definite, um, when I see that there's a definite thought process behind it, or even, you know, like getting asked about Nightmare Moon, um, I hadn't, I'd like to write her, I hadn't thought about her that much, but just getting that kind of focus. Or if there are aspects of the character that are interesting. Um, you know, first about their history, like, you know, would you like to see uh, Luna and Celestia when they were kids? Yeah, that's interesting to me. Um, when you get people saying, oh, I really want to see these two characters team up and I want you to, you know, I ship these characters and you need to bring them together, that's less interesting. I'm not going to, I'm not going to deny that I put Flutterbat in the story or that I pitched a Flutterbat story because she was popular. Because that, that's a huge part of it. But I didn't do it just because of that. I didn't, I didn't take a story that didn't need to have Flutterbat in it and put Flutterbat in it because that would have meant that more people read. I needed to come up with a story that was a Flutterbat story that justified me bringing my character back. So that's that's where I, that's how I balance that stuff out. There are things people want to see. There are people, you know, you don't always give them what they ask for. But it's sometimes an interesting intellectual starting point to go, oh, well, it would be it would be cool if this happened or you suggested that I do this, you were wrong, but you got me thinking about doing this. Does that answer that? I feel like I, I went far afield on it. Anything else? Because we, we have a minute. So one last quick question. What did you think of Jurassic World? I really liked it. Uh, people are dumb in it, but they're not dumb for too long, which is important. I heard a lot of people say how stupid the characters were, and they do dumb things, don't get me wrong, but they're not. When Chris Pratt says, you got, you got, we got to do this, and you're like, oh, he's ultimately right, they didn't delay doing the thing he suggested for too long. It's like, I can see where somebody would say, oh, we got a better solution than that, and then, oh, no, no, we need to do that, he was right all along. Uh, but yeah, and, and Chris Pratt's just awesome, so I got, I got no, no flaws there. Do you find yourself discarding stories because they won't, because they're too long to fit in a comic format? I I have not. Um, usually, I can figure out a way to make it work. Uh, I originally pitched the Flutterbat thing as four issues, and Bobby was right; it, it was a two-issue story, and I, I did not I did not think that all the way through. So 
I would find ways to break it into pieces. Like, I, I have a sequel for the Flutterbat comic, um, which if it goes well, I would like to pitch. But I would not have pitched that straight up as a... I wouldn't have pitched that part as a straight up four-part arc. I would have figured out a way to break it and say, let's let's revisit that. Because um, the Pony Books, the, the Friendship is Magic are either two or four issues. There are three-issue arcs or six-issue arcs. So it's staying within that format, but it is not unworkable to do that. So... I think that's all the time we have. I have to go do a signing. So I am in Artist Alley. I am also Tom Zoller, T-H-O-M-Z-A-H-L-E-R on Twitter, uh, Tom Zoller on Facebook. Um, you can't swing a dead cat and not hit me on social media. So, all right, thank you all for coming.